Vanguard Church on mission. Our mission is to equip every generation to reach the relational world for Christ. We want to create an environment where unchurched people love to attend. And I'm not just talking about our Sunday morning worship services. I'm talking about wherever you find yourself, if you're serving at Barranca Elementary, if you're at work, if you're in the community, that you create a space where unchurched people who are far from God feel and experience the love of Christ through you. Amen. That's what we're called to do. And so we have some faith goals around here that we are uh, reaching for. And uh, I haven't mentioned these in a while. Well, I haven't been here in a while as well, coming back from sabbatical. But our faith goal is, is to be a growing church by 2022, March 2022. We're praying that we would have see 600 people here on a regular basis, worshiping and growing in Christ, 200 students and children doing the same, and have celebrated 100 baptisms as people uh, take that next step of faith in Christ. But we need to understand that we can be about the numbers in the right way or in the wrong way. And, and I believe every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. And so we want to be about numbers in the right way because people who aren't even here yet, they count to God and they should count to us and we should be praying for them, pursuing them, and celebrating what God is doing in the lives of people and their stories uh, right now. And so that's what we're going to do right now. And, and I, I praise God for a couple amazing things that he has done recently around here. Number one being the Christmas tea, the women's Christmas tea. How many of you were there? There's a, there's a picture. It was an amazing event. I was there for just a little bit to pray and then they kicked me out. Um, but 225 women showed up. Many of your oikos, your eight to 15, those people who are far from God came. Um, even it, we were graced with the presence of, of a Muslim woman who came and she had a wonderful time. So congratulations on creating an environment, ladies, where people felt the love of Christ. Christ, uh, flow in that environment. And then last weekend, we had, uh, what was it, about 587 people on our campus for Christmas in Covina, uh, celebrating Christ, celebrating the reason for this season. How many of you were there uh, this past weekend? Awesome. It was uh, just an awesome celebration. So many people uh, said to uh, our, our host team director, Chuck Benson, that they, in their opinion, it was the best yet at Christmas in Covina. So just so proud of everybody and the work that they put into uh, creating an environment to reach out uh, with the gospel. So this morning, we, we continue in our series, Christmas Calls. And uh, normally, I wouldn't recommend that you listen into another person's call, but these ones ones are too good to not tune in and listen. And if you remember week one, we talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus, how Mary was called to trust the journey that God had for her, even though she questioned the destination. Uh, you know, the angel Gabriel came and said, you're going to be with child. And she's like, how can that be? I'm a virgin. So she didn't completely understand or even trust that, that she's going to get to a particular destination. She didn't feel the flutter of her unborn child in the moment when God's messenger, the angel came and brought her that call calling, but she decided to trust the word of the Lord, no matter what it is and go in that direction. And then her husband, Joseph, we looked at last week, Joseph was a man of integrity who in comparison to his wife, Mary, and to his son, Jesus, he had an underwhelming call from God in comparison. And so we uh, considered the question, what if the biggest impact you'll make uh, this Christmas or in this season of your life isn't your accomplishments, but the accomplishments of others because of your support? And Joseph was called to two things, to be a husband. God said, take Mary as your wife even though he was going to divorce her quietly. Remember we talked about that last week, but his Christmas call was take Mary as your wife and be a dad to this child whose name is going to be Jesus. So this morning, uh, we're going to look at a third and final Christmas call. Turn to Isaiah chapter uh, 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Uh, kind of turn to the left if you have your physical copy of Scripture. Uh, open your Bible app and scroll there. Isaiah chapter 9. Now this one is an unstoppable call from Jesus. And this call happened 700 years before Jesus' birth. And so it's an incredible prophecy. And the prophet's name was Isaiah. And he shared this word from God. God in a tumultuous time in history. See, Israel's enemy at the time were the Assyrians. 
And the Assyrians were on the march, destroying entire cities and taking a lot of people uh, into captivity as slaves. And, and Isaiah's prophecy of God's rescuer of his people, and, and they, they named, they called him and referred to him as the Messiah, and, and it gave people hope that they desperately needed at this time in history. There was unimaginable pain and chaos, and yet God says, don't worry. I have a plan. Don't look to your circumstances to find hope. I know they're pretty hopeless right now. But he says, look to me. I have a plan of hope despite the chaos in your life. I'll provide my son as a rescuer. And here's what's important to know about him. And I would say if your life in Christmas in 2019 is a little upside down, a little chaotic, if you're depressed, if you're frustrated, if you're bitter, or if you're in a feud or in a fight and, and, and you just can't stand getting up in the morning because you have to face that chaos for one more day, maybe God has a message for you directly this morning. Let's look at Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. It says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be what? no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice. Praise God for justice. How many of you have ever been through injustice in your direction? Put up your hand. If you've ever felt somebody has totally not been just in the way they've treated you. Well, praise God that God makes it all right in his kingdom and justice will be upheld along with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that whatever chaos is churning in our hearts and in our minds, God, that you would help us, because we can't do it on our own, that you would help us to lay it aside, to lay the temptation that we all have of idolatry to bow down and worship at the altar of our circumstances and to elevate our circumstances to a platform it was never designed to be at where we can get so emotional, whether it's frustration or bitterness or anger, we can throw so much emotion into a circumstance or to a ruptured relationship from person to person, God, and we've never thrown that much emotion in terms of worship and honor in your direction. And so God, help us to repent from that and help us to worship the King of Kings this morning. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, pull out your sermon outline notes. They are in your bulletin and you can fill in the blanks. Number one is wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. He, Jesus, is a wonderful counselor. And that term wonderful, it means incomprehensible. It means in the Hebrew, extraordinary, marvelous, incomprehensible. In your extraordinary pain, God provides extraordinary counsel. That is an incredible gift to you this Christmas. See, most people are going through a big trial or they just got through uh, a big trial or they are about to go through a big trial. Life is full of trials. Jesus warned the disciples uh, when he was teaching them and walking with them, he warned them about his upcoming arrest and death on the cross and how they, his followers who walk with him, will be scattered from their homes, running for their very lives. But then Jesus gave some wonderful counsel. He said this in John 16, 33. He said, I have said these things to you, as in I have said and warned you, you know, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. But I've said these things to you that in me, you will have peace. In me, you will have peace. If you keep running up against 
not peace all the time, all the time, take stock of where you're running. Maybe you're not running to Jesus. Maybe you're self-deceived and thinking and trying to find peace somewhere else. That in me, you have peace. In the world, you will have what? You'll have tribulation, but take, this is awesome. Jesus doesn't say take your circumstance and change them because sometimes you just can't change things. Sometimes you can't. Life can be cruddy and it's just the way it is for a season or for a longer period than that. But Jesus doesn't say, take your circumstances. He says, take your heart and invite him to be the center. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Sometimes we don't need to change our circumstances. We just need to change our perspective. That term overcome means to conquer, victorious over all foes. Jesus is and will be victorious over all your foes and over all injustice. He will make things right. As much as you want to make things right and make people treat you right, God's going to do a better job than you will. So leave it with him and trust him with it. See, God has the big picture taken care of. Keep your eyes on the incomprehensible wonder of Jesus. Who has the power to defeat death? And he has the, de- the power to defeat what is dead in your life or in your heart or in your mind. So keep your ear tuned to God's word. Keep your ear tuned to God's word. Get in it on a daily basis. Get that truth into you. I'm excited, as Amber mentioned, how to study the Bible is a brand new sermon series starting January 5th because we all need to learn a little bit more and be encouraged more and be equipped more to get into the truth of God's word. So don't miss it. Invite your oikos because Jesus has so much to say to each and every one of you and give you wonderful counsel. See, counsel that seems counterintuitive to the human mind when he gives it. But understand, God's thoughts are above your thoughts, way above. But the counsel that Jesus gives is always the right answer. I want to share some of his counsel that he gives you. It's not all of it, but just some of it, some of Jesus' good counsel, even in the midst of chaos. Here's here's Jesus' counsel. He says, do good to those who hate you. Okay. Okay. Do good to those who hate you. He says, whoever wants to be great must be a servant. I mean, you know, the point he's making is that everybody wants to be great. You want to be great. I want to be great. We all want to be great. Here's how to be great. Be a servant. Serve anybody and everybody who is around you, even when you don't feel like it. Here's some great counsel. No service opportunity is beneath you. Jesus got down on his knees and he wiped the crud off of his followers, his students' feet. And back then, they didn't have clean, sanitized freeways. They probably had dirt paths and a lot of animals who dropped presents would be walking before you would walk on it, okay? Are you smelling what I'm stepping in? Are you with me? Okay, so Jesus said, by his example, no service opportunity is beneath you or me. He says, forgive others, forgive others. Every single one of you, I don't know every single one of you well, but here's what I know about you. There's somebody God is calling you to forgive. And maybe you've held something against them for days, weeks, and years. And he's working in me. He's working in you with his wonderful counsel. He says, don't speak reckless words to others. Build others up according to their needs. Be careful with what comes out of your mouth because it can bring death or life. So speak life into other people's lives. Develop your talents. This is counsel, wonderful counsel. Develop your talents to bless and help others find Christ. Not to find how good you are. Even if you are good, even if you are an expert in your field, it's not about you. When Ken comes and brings his incredible talent and gift of his voice that he shared us this morning, He doesn't do that in order to bring attention to him. Neither should you in what God has blessed and gifted you in. And then Christ followers have a purpose. They are called to fish. Followers fish. Fish for who? You fish for people. You fish for being a conduit of God's grace and mercy and love to other people. And if you haven't been fishing, you need to be repenting. You need to be asking for forgiveness from God, because that is what each and every one of us are called to do 
to anybody who crosses your path, your neighbor, your coworker, your client, your boss, the person you love, the person you hate, the person you just meet, even the Iranian locksmith who unlocks your car because you lost your car keys. Like what happened to me a couple days ago. You're called to be, even if they're a Muslim, you're called to invite them, invite them to church. There is so much other teaching from Jesus and, and his word that is perfect counseling no matter what you're going through. Jesus makes life better and makes us better at life. I believe it. Do you believe it? Merry Christmas. You have a wonderful counselor. You do. Number two, mighty God. Mighty God. Jesus does things only God can do, such as forgive sins and command nature to obey him. Check it out in Matthew 9. It says, in getting into a boat, uh, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes uh, said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. He's blaspheming. Why? Because only God can forgive sins and Jesus forgave his sins. Jesus is mighty God. Matthew 8, 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves and he was asleep. And they went and woke him saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? O you of little faith. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was great calm. And the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this? That even winds and sea obey him. He is a mighty God. He can defeat death. Jairus. The guy from Mark chapter five, whose daughter was gone. She was dead. And Jesus raised her from the dead. He has the power to do it. Jesus is mighty God whose power defeated death and whose power can overcome any obstacle in your life. If Jesus doesn't remove your challenges, if Jesus doesn't remove your challenges in the way and time you would prefer, it's not because he can't. It's not because he can't. It's because he has something better in mind for you. And you need to trust him in that. It's not easy. You will have tribulation, but take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. Merry Christmas. You have a mighty God. Number three, everlasting father, everlasting father. Few words in any language evoke the kind of feelings that we have when we hear the term father. Some of us will feel a sense of loss this Christmas season, either because we had fathers who were wonderful but are no longer with us, or because we have unfulfilled longings in our heart. We have, we have uh, this daddy pain uh, for the kind of father we've never had and that we missed and we wish we had. But how comforting that we have a perfect fatherly savior forever, forever. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God and the exact representation of his being. Jesus alone makes the father known. Indeed, no one can come to the father, but through Christ. Jesus said about himself in John 10, I and the father are one. No one understand that the father is in me and I am in the father, Jesus says. And he also said in John 14, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? See, even some of his disciples have been with him for so long. They, they, they miss this. And maybe sometimes you miss this with regards to Jesus and who we celebrate this Christmas season. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? I like how Charles Spurgeon put it. He put it this way. He said, there is no unfathering Christ and there is no unchilding us. He is everlastingly a father to those who trust in him. See, if you have experienced the pain of a a father who was absent, maybe emotionally, maybe mentally, or maybe physically, or all three, just know Jesus is everlasting. He will forever 
be there for you and will never leave. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So I want to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads at this time. I want to give you an opportunity just to talk to your fatherly savior, to talk to Jesus and just share what's on your heart. Maybe there's chaos going in your life right now. And you just need to be like, Jesus, help me. And thank you for being with me through it. And Jesus, help me to run to you for that wonderful counsel. Maybe you need to repent and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I keep running to myself and I forget you. Or I keep running to other circumstances or other people and and you're forgetting to run to Jesus. So I want to encourage you, take a moment right now before your everlasting father, your mighty God, your wonderful counselor, and just pour out your heart silently for the next 30 seconds. God, we thank you and we praise you that you are the God who can calm the storms of chaos in our lives. You are able. And God, even if they're not calm when we leave this place today or head back to work tomorrow or get together with family and friends that we haven't seen in a long time because there's a lot of pain or frustration or bitterness, lack of forgiveness. Thank you that you are our everlasting father. You'll never leave us or forsake us. You are there to provide wonderful counsel in a moment's notice. We thank you for being Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, number four is Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Uh, It's a struggle to think of Jesus as our Prince of Peace today. When you uh, turn on the news, there's a lot of conflict going on uh, always in our world, uh, in our governments. Um, (laughs) it, it, It is so tough out there. And some of you don't have peace right now in your life. Uh, maybe there's conflict in your family, uh, with friends again at work. And, you know, I just got to say, if there is a lot of that going on in your life, thank you for coming to church this morning. Because you know what? Uh, When you are broken to pieces on the inside, it's not easy to come and receive a big handshake and a big smile from all these church Jesus crazy followers. (laughs) And uh, so I get it. Thank you for coming to church. And even if you're not a Jesus follower, thank you for coming. It's our honor uh, to host you this morning. And uh, you can come here without believing. You can. You can belong before you believe. That's the amazing, amazing thing about Jesus is he so loves, God so loves the world that he gave Jesus uh, for the world, no matter where we're at in our walk with him. So thank you for coming. But how do we reconcile our lack of peace Uh, with the fact that we have a Prince of Peace this Christmas season. Well, understand that the Bible doesn't run away from the fact that the world isn't in peace. In fact, when Jesus came, the world was chaotic. The Roman Empire, it it was uh, a a government way worse than any, you know, our government that we've experienced in modern history. I'm telling you, it's absolutely true. Yes, things can change overnight, but thank God uh, for the blessing that we have had in our generation so far. And let's pray that God would continue to intervene and and bring peace in in our government and in our country because the country that Jesus was born into, uh, it was overrun and taken over by their enemy, the Romans, and there was no peace. And and we can look for ultimate peace in the world and, and not see it and just get depressed, especially when it's at the world stage, government against government. Uh, but it's hard even when there's no peace within ourselves because we can search for peace within ourselves and there's just pain that we can find. And, and sometimes we can try to create that peace on our own, or we can look for um, organizations or governments to create that peace. But guess what? They are going to fall short. And we shouldn't be surprised when the peace falls short because people fall short. People fall short. 
and yet we're still surprised. We got to remember that we all fall short. But sometimes we try to hold on to that peace and, and we even can self-deceive ourselves and think that we can, we can bring the peace. No, no, no. Jesus is the one who brings the peace. But we try. <laughs> like this one guy a few years ago, uh, he played for the L.A. Lakers basketball team. His name was Ron Artest. <laughs> and if you know anything about him, he changed his name from Ron Artest to what? Meta world peace. <laughs> he claimed to be not only world peace, but the meta version, the, the big version, the overarching version of world peace. But that's hard to deliver on for anybody, including Ron or Test. And that's, that's challenging to live up to that name. Such a peaceful smile. bringing the peace. <laughs> Meta world peace. <laughs> we can try. And maybe he tried. I don't know if he ever tried. <laughs> but only Christ can bring the ultimate peace that we look for. We can't get it from within. We can't get it from anywhere externally. Again, organizations or people. But God doesn't give up on us. That's the hope that we find in this Christmas call. He doesn't give up on us as we live in this world of conflict. God gives up his son for us within this world of conflict. That term peace in Hebrew is shalom. Everybody say shalom to the person beside you. Say it to your neighbor. Say shalom. It's a wonderful word. We need to hear that. Shalom. Say it to the other person on the other side of you. Come on, go ahead. We can all use a little more shalom and peace in our lives. Now, shalom, it doesn't, it doesn't just mean the absence of fighting, but it means to flourish and experience fullness and completeness. Like Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus would often greet people and say, peace be with you. Peace be with you. There is an amazing story about the unstoppable peace, and we shared it last weekend, and Ken talked about it this morning, and I want to show it to you again because it's worth seeing again. It is so powerful. I want to show you that video of World War I. If, if you were, how many of you saw it? Wait, wait, not yet, not yet, not yet. Let me set it up. But how, you, how many were here at Christmas in Covina? You saw it, okay. So a lot of you didn't see it, but so worth talking about because Jesus can bring not only peace between you and him, but he can bring peace in relationships, in families and in governments. And again, what was happening at this time, 1914, World War I, a trench warfare, and the Allies were in one trench that they had dug into the ground, this big, wide, and long ditch. And then 150 to 750 feet away is the Germans' trench. Like, you can look into the whites of the guy's eyes that you're about to shoot at. I mean, understand the, uh, the tension and the conflict. And in the middle, between those tensions, uh, there's this uh, gap of land. It has a name. Do you remember? No man's land. No man's land full of barbed wire fence and landmines. It's a dangerous place to be. And uh, this uh, supermarket in the UK, they put together this incredible commercial. Somebody asked me after first service, is there a movie out? Because that is that a movie trailer? Uh, no, it's a commercial, but it's so well done. So check out what happened Christmas Eve, 1914, between bitter enemies.
Amazing. It's the power of the Christ in the song Silent Night that has the power to unite enemies. It's Jesus is truly the Prince of Peace. In Luke 2, 14, the angels sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Understand this. God is pleased with you. When he created, he said mankind was good. We are sinners, but he loves us. He is for you and not against you. And God loves you so much that he didn't just meet you in no man's land halfway. He came all the way into enemy territory and he was born in Bethlehem in a dangerous time in this, the history of this world. Why? Because of his love for you and for me. So I want to encourage you, come to Christ if you aren't a believer in him. If you're a believer and you've just kind of been apathetic in your faith and in your walk with Jesus, come back and ask God for new zeal for Jesus, for learning from him, for making him your wonderful counselor. But you can come to Christ. It's as easy as ABC. A, admit that you're a sinner. You fall short of the glory of God. We all do. Be believe that Jesus solved that problem, the sin problem, by dying on the cross for your sins, in your place, in my place. And then C, choose to follow Christ. Choose to make him the Lord and Savior of your heart and mind and strength as you continue in the journey that he calls you to. So, Merry Christmas. You have a wonderful counselor a mighty God, an everlasting Father, and a Prince of Peace. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this reminder this morning who your son truly is that we celebrate during this season. God, I pray that we would take your word and your wisdom and your counsel into our celebrations with family and friends and neighbors and strangers that we come across, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.